Louisiana's world-famous wild oysters are getting harder and harder to come by. In fact, almost all of America's wild oyster populations have vanished. And the ones that are left face increasingly powerful storms as well as oil spills and disease. Every single one of those things on that list, a different one hits us every single year. Oysters! The millions of tons of oysters served up in restaurants every year are mostly farmed. But oysters are not just for eating. They're also essential for the environment. They build reefs and filter water, and losing them leaves places like Louisiana worse off in the fight against erosion and pollution. We need more oysters in the water, whether they're on the bottom or in cages, period. They just do so much for the environment. Conservationists think they can restore America's wild oyster reefs. It's really not hard to imagine recovering oysters as a habitat and a fishery in the same place at the same time. So what's the true cost of losing America's wild oysters? And is it too late to bring them back? Take a look at this picture from the turn of the 20th century. These people are standing on a mountain of oyster shells, a regular sight in coastal American cities about 130 years ago. Between 1880 and 1910, fishermen were harvesting 160 million pounds of wild oyster meat per year. That's more than every other country in the world combined, and nearly seven times what we farm today. Everybody remembers the black and white pictures of Louisiana oyster boats loaded down with oyster shell. The reason they're all in black and white is because it's been that long since we've had that many oysters. Even the massive hauls of the late 1990s feel like a distant dream to fishermen like Scott Maurer. There used to be 50, 60 foot oyster boats that would come in here every day, and you don't see any of those anymore. Farming oysters today isn't easy. Fresh water, salt water, spills, it impacts the oysters and it stresses them. Only about 10,000 of Scott's oysters survived the 2021 hurricane season. I have had up to a million oysters on the farm. We basically only have like two and a half to three lines right here. That's all that we have left for the market size oysters. Scott's oysters aren't wild. For that, they would need to reproduce naturally, but the wild population just isn't large enough to make that happen. So Scott and other farmers in Louisiana have to fertilize and then seed their oysters artificially. Most farmers in Louisiana don't raise oysters in floating cages like Scott does. They actually do that on the seafloor. They seed and install limestone substrate or use old oyster shells to start the reefs off. But Scott can't get a lease to do that. Louisiana issued a moratorium on new leases back in 2002, after it got into a legal battle with oyster farmers over coastal restoration work. The state diverted fresh water upstream, but it ended up disturbing reef growth because oysters are sensitive. Too much fresh water or even too much salt water from a storm surge can lead to mass die-offs. To top it off, oyster reefs were already in bad shape. Since 1917, Louisiana has led an effort to replenish the sea. It started dumping oyster shells, limestone, and concrete onto beds so that new oysters could attach to them. It's something the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Department still does today. But it was too little, too late. Experts say that today, less than 1% of America's wild oyster reefs remain. But 230 miles west of Scott's oyster farm, conservationists are celebrating some small but significant oyster-shaped success. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six oysters are, have grown on. Seth Blitch has been working to restore Louisiana's coastline for nearly a decade. This cluster of oysters and clams is a really good sign. This is the rock. So the rock in the cages is generally about that big. And and it's got, a, it's got a whole bunch of life on it. Look, The rocks he's talking about start out in big wire cages called gabions that get lowered into the water to give oysters something to attach to. Since 2017, Seth and his team have dropped nearly 2,000 along this shoreline. I'm standing actually kind of up on the oyster reef itself. This year, in 2022, we're putting another mile in. So all told, by the end of this summer, we'll have two and a half linear miles of restructure here in Calcasieu Lake. 
Kalkashu Lake is an estuary, which is basically a transition zone between rivers and the ocean. It's surrounded by coastal wetlands, which work best as a line of defense against high tides and storm surges when they're reinforced by structures like oyster reefs. If you look at the rock by itself, it's about that tall. If you look at the rock with the oysters, it's almost twice as, over twice as tall. And so it, that's how the reef actually grows in height and that enhances its value to protect this shoreline right here by abating some of the wave energy that comes across the lake. Building the reefs helps slow down erosion, which is a huge deal in Louisiana. Since the 1930s, an area of land the size of Delaware has disappeared. Part of the problem is that levees built to stop the Mississippi River from flooding also block sediment that would otherwise build up the shorelines every year. Instead, the sediment washes straight out into the Gulf. Oysters won't save the coast by themselves, but they are definitely part of a network of things that need to happen. Since Seth's team installed the first mile of gabions five years ago, they noticed that erosion in that part of the shoreline slowed down. Those oysters will create a living, mature reef that'll maintain itself over space and time. And building up a healthy oyster reef that's off limits to harvesting provides huge benefits to fishermen. These oysters that I'm holding right now are, are gonna reproduce. And a lot of those, those larvae, that, that spat, will float through the lake and they'll settle on some of the reefs that do get harvested. This approach has succeeded on the East Coast and the Chesapeake Bay. Fishers here harvested more wild oysters in 2021 than they had in 35 years. That's because conservationists have spent decades seeding more than 5.4 billion oysters on 1,200 acres of newly restored reefs. Even then, oyster populations in the bay are still at only 1 to 2 percent of their historic levels. Further north, New York Harbor is seeing a promising rebound, too. 75 million adult oysters now grow on shells, stone, and porcelain planted by conservationists and volunteers with an initiative called the Billion Oyster Project. I would like to see sanctuary reefs never dredged or never fished at all. And if we had those located throughout the bay in various spots, you'd always have broodstock or parent oysters to reseed the natural stocks. For now, Scott still has to rely on seeding the oysters that he'll eventually harvest and sell to restaurants. We have to have the oysters under mechanical refrigeration within one hour of harvest. From that point on, as long as they stay you know, refrigerated below 45 degrees, then, um, then we're good. We're good to go to the restaurant. Scott sells most of his harvest locally in New Orleans. Hey, how's it going, going man? man? Doing good, doing good. We got a, got a load for you today. Awesome. He's handing over about a thousand oysters to JV Foods, a local food distributor. Right. There you go, sir. Appreciate it. All right, we'll put the rest in the cooler in a second. Today, they're delivering to an oyster bar in New Orleans called Sidecar. farm in the Gulf. I thought that would be a good way to celebrate National Oyster Day. Oyster sommelier Lindsay Alday and her team have been serving up Scott's oysters since the restaurant opened in 2020. They're really good and salty. They're always nice and clean. The meat's beautiful. Same, same, to you. Recycle same them. to you. Yeah. Lindsay saves the shells and sends them to a recycling program with the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. And they've been running a program here for, I think, about a decade, running oyster shells back into the Gulf. During the busy season, Lindsay and her team will sell around 10,000 oysters a week, sourced from Scott and other farmers across the country. And they serve them with everything from horseradish to hot sauce. We also asked Scott for his tips on how to dress an oyster. There's a lot of people that ask what my favorite topping on an oyster is. I don't necessarily have a favorite, I just have a least favorite, and that's cocktail sauce. I don't feel that these oysters have to be covered up with cocktail sauce. So this is a little mignonette that we make that I feel accentuates the oyster without covering it up. There we go. Take that. A little bit of this right here. There's some vinegar sauce in there. 